Let's consider two transmitters for sim simplicity. Here's transmitter number one, and here's transmitter number two. Also for simplicity, let's say both of these transmitters are synchronized, perhaps using auto atomic clocks so that they can transmit at exactly the same time. And let's also say that they're going to transmit at 10 kilohertz. And the wavelength at 10 kilohertz in air is 30 kilometers. So again, for simplicity, it's helpful to start simple. Let's say these two stations are exactly one wavelength apart, so 30 kilometers apart. Now let's say that there's a ship and it's at a port at the station on the left, at station number one. At station number one, the signals from station number one and number two are in phase because there are an integer number of wavelengths between the two stations. As a result, the signal from station number one, if it looks like this, I'm just going to draw one wavelength. Station number two, they're going to be in phase, so I'm going to, it's going to look the same. And let's make a note about that. In phase, when the ship is docked at station number one, the two signals are in phase. However, as the ship starts to move horizontally away from station number one, the, towards station number two, the signals are no longer going to overlap in time and they're no longer in phase. And this phase difference comes from the fact that the phase of the signal from station one increases. There's a phase delay as we move away from station one towards station two. So let's go ahead and draw this ship here. Let's say it's lambda over four at this moment from station number one. So because there's a time amount of, it takes amount of, some amount of time for the wave to propagate from station number one to the ship, there's now a phase delay in the signal. But now it's closer to station number two, so the phase it occurs, the signal occurs earlier in time, and so the phase is decreasing at the same rate uh, from signal number two, station number two, as we move away from station number one. So let's say at a quarter of a wavelength from station number one, the signals are going to be 180 degrees at a phase. So the signal from station number two, there's a phase delay. So I'm going to start at the top and it'll look like this. And from station number two, there's a phase decrease. So we're occurring earlier in time. So I'm going to start here on the bottom and we'll get something like this. So this one is, um, let's see, phase increase. And this one has a phase decrease. And so these, at this moment, they are out completely out of phase, one quarter of a wavelength away from station number one. Then as the ship moves even further away from station number one towards station number two, let's now put the ship halfway between, so this is a ship. At a distance of half of a wavelength, the phase of the signal from station number one has increased by 180 degrees. So now it's going to look like that. And the signal from station number two has decreased by 180 degrees. And so the two signals are in phase again. This means that every half of a wavelength between the two transmitters, the two signals are gonna be in phase again. So we, what we can do is we can draw a vertical line at these locations where the signals are in phase, and we can call these lines of positions, lines of position, or LOP. Anywhere along these lines of position, anywhere along this line, the ship would be an equal distance from both transmitters, straight across or at an angle, and the two signals will be in phase anywhere along this line of position. 
So now, what we've done here is we've divided up the space between the transmitters into lanes. Here is lane number one, and here is lane number two. At 10 kilohertz, this is half a wavelength, so the lanes will be 15 kilometers wide. So we can figure out how far we are from either transmitter by figuring out which lane we are in. For example, counting the lanes as we travel from station one towards station two. And then we can refine our position even better by knowing the percent phase difference between the signals within a lane. If we extrapolate this idea to anywhere around the world, in order to be able to determine the position of a receiver, we will probably need at least two or more detectable LOPs, or lines of position, in the vicinity of that receiver. Here is a diagram of three sets of LOPs. Each line of position requires two transmitters, since the line of position is created by comparing the phases of two signals. So six transmitters are required to make this grid of LOPs and these phase lanes. All right, well now that we have an idea of how our ground-based geolocation system might work, one of the first things we should probably check is over what distances the VLF signals are strong enough to be received and how reliable that signal is. For a signal to be received, the receiver needs to be sensitive enough to detect the signal but also the signal must be higher than whatever the background noise level is. There are ways to extract signals that are even below the background noise level, but comparing the signal strength with the background noise level is a good benchmark, good place to start. Here's an example plot of the background noise level for the magnetic flux density B in the Earth ionosphere waveguide at different frequencies. This graph was created by combining several different measurement data sets the x-axis here is frequency plotted on a log scale. So 10 kilohertz, which we've been considering, would be 1E4, or right around 4 on this plot. We can see that lightning creates electromagnetic waves in this frequency range as well. And that raises the background noise level. The y-axis plots the background noise level also on a log scale, and with units of Te tesla per root hertz. That means to get the background magnetic flux density level in units of tesla, we need to multiply by the square root of the bandwidth in, free in hertz of our receiver. That will get rid of the uh, root hertz in the denominator and we'll just be left with tesla, the background noise level in units of tesla. But our model doesn't directly solve for B fields. We only solve for electric fields, E, in units of volts per meter, and H, in units of amps per meter. So how can we compare our model output with the B fields in this plot? Well, from the constitutive relations, we know that B is equal to mu H. So we would have to make sure to remember to divide these B fields by mu before comparing them to the H fields from our FDTD model. And if our observation point is in the far field of the transmitter, we could also, for simplicity, assume a plane wave relationship between these B fields the and the corresponding electric field. So we could divide the B field shown in this plot by mu, and then also multiply by the characteristic impedance of free space to get the corresponding E field or background E field level. At any rate, this is a good starting point for determining the background noise levels of the electric and magnetic fields in the Earth ionosphere waveguide. And we can see over what distances from the transmitter our signal will be above these background levels by comparing against these background levels. In order to allow for a comparison with the background electromagnetic fields, we need to figure out how strong of a signal we can expect at various distances from the transmitter we are modeling. Let's look into this using the 2.5 FDTD model we've constructed. In the two-dimensional plots we've created so far, we've only been looking at snapshots in time of the propagating wave. For example, we created this one earlier. This is a snapshot in time, 500 time steps after the transmitter was turned on. 
Since our source is a sinusoid, we can see a sinusoidally varying electromagnetic wave propagating away from the transmitter. So at these positions along the ground where we see dark blue, at these positions right at this moment in time, the signal strength is very low. But this is just because of the phase of the signal at these positions and at this moment in time. What about over all time? How strong of a signal can we expect to receive all along the surface of the Earth as the distance from the transmitter increases? Think about how you would use your FTTD model to determine the magnitude of the signal that could be received at different distances from the transmitter. So magnitude versus distance. 